Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 30th. Today, we celebrate the botanical illustrator who was wrongfully fired from his first job and the French botanist who spent a month in California with a boatload of Russians. We'll learn about the botanical name of the city where people leave their hearts. And we'll fall in love with a classic garden writer from Bronxville, New York. Today's unearthed words feature an English poet who loved gardens and wrote many poems about them. And we grow that garden library with a book that talks about the revolution that will save our food. I'll talk about a garden item that I have way too many of, but then again, can you really have too many? I digress. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of the woman who wrote a flora dictionary anonymously, signing her work very mysteriously with the words, by a lady. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. We'll start out today's curated articles with a blog post from Allison Levy over at her blog, The Blackberry Garden. On January 19th of this year, Allison wrote a post called Good Decisions, Making Decisions in the Garden. She wrote, deciding what to plant, when to plant, what to remove, what to let be. Do I do this today or tomorrow or ever? Many gardening decisions are fairly benign. You think about what the desired outcome is. When you get to that point, decide if you like it or not. And if not, decide what to try next. And she wrote that the most difficult thing for her is waiting for the outcome. I think most of us would agree with that. Allison's blog is a favorite of mine. I love how she writes and I love what she writes about. Let me give you an example from this post where she's talking about cyclamen. She writes, Cyclamen are one of my favorite early spring flowers, and having them start to naturalize is a moment of sheer joy for me. This patch at the top of the garden was started from three pots bought probably five or so years ago. I planted them and whispered to the nearby ants, when you wake up, take the seeds and spread them throughout the garden. Love that. She wrote, At first I thought they might not have heard me, but it turns out they must have because a few years later, they're now popping up throughout the garden. Planting cyclamen was a good decision. Then she goes on to share other good decisions that she's made in her garden. And I thought her post was a good reminder for all of us to celebrate the good decisions, the good choices that we've made in our gardens. Sometimes our choices are thoroughly researched. We can't help but not get it wrong. But sometimes our choices have an element of luck. I wish both for you in your 2020 garden, good research and a little bit of luck. If you'd like to read Allison's post called Good Decisions, and I think you should, just search for the word decisions in the free Facebook group for the show, and Allison's post will pop right up. Next up is a post from the podcast and blog, In Defense of Plants, and it talks about the plight of the African violets. This post was published over a year ago, but unfortunately, it's timeless for us right now. For a lot of us, African violets are some of our favorite houseplants. And as this blog post points out, for many of us, it's the first houseplant that we learn to grow. And if you didn't know, many African violets are teetering on the brink of extinction. How sad. The Latin name for African violet is St. Paulia Ionantha. It's a genus that's found in a very small section of East Africa, 
You have to look for them in Tanzania and Kenya and the Eastern Arc Mountains. This is a very serious and thoughtful post from In Defense of Plants. And if you'd like to read more about this topic, you can search for it in the free Facebook group for the show by typing Violet into the search bar. Now, if you'd like to check out these curated articles for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of my curated posts in the listener community in the free Facebook group. It's called the Daily Gardener Community, and there's no need to take notes or search for links. All you have to do is search for the keyword. If you hear something on the show and you want to read more about it, just type in the word when you're on the page, when you're in the group for the show, and then these posts will pop up. If you'd like to participate in that and get all of the curated articles to show up in your Facebook feed, interspersed among the beautiful pictures of your friends and family, all you have to do is the next time you're on Facebook, head on up to the search bar, type in the Daily Gardener Community. Our group will show up. Then you just click request to join and then I'll get a notification on my phone and I'll admit you into the group and I'd love to meet you there. Go ahead and post pictures of your garden, ask questions, share some poetry with me. I love all that stuff. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the botanist and the incomparable botanical illustrator George Dionysus Eret, who was born on this day in 1708. Eret was born in Heidelberg, Germany, to Ferdinand Christian Eret, who was a gardener and also had a talent for drawing. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. Christian taught his son both skills, gardening and drawing, before he died. George made his way to Regensburg, and there he met an apothecary who hired him to draw specimens from his herbarium and garden. George earnestly took on the job, creating over 500 pieces in one year. Taking advantage of his young employee, the apothecary fired George and told him he should have completed a thousand drawings. It was basically the apothecary's way of avoiding paying George. After this dreadful experience, George made his way to England and he worked at the significant botanical gardens there, including the Chelsea Physic. Isaac Rand, the first director of the Chelsea Physic Garden in London, told George to paint the rare plants in the garden. The uniqueness of the specimens added to the demand for George's work, and as a result, George was on friendly terms with the plant collectors and naturalists of his time. Chelsea was formative professionally and personally for George, he married the head gardener's sister-in-law, Susanna Kennett. In The Art of Botanical Illustration, Wilfred Blunt noted that by the middle of the century, George had become a popular figure in London society. The highest nobility in England clamored to receive instruction from him. Indeed, the wealthiest woman in England, the Duchess of Portland, gladly retained George as a drawing instructor. Struck by the luminescence of his work, she would ultimately buy over 300 of his paintings. In 1737, George was hired to draw by Sir Charles Wagner, the first Lord of the Admiralty. In August of that year, Wagner's personal garden is where George first observed the Magnolia grandiflora flowering. The bloom was so inspiring that George walked for an hour each way from Chelsea to Wagner's house 
to see and sketch every stage of the Magnolia grandiflora, from bud to full flower. George's work provided the world with the first magnolia to be illustrated in England. Beyond his work, George traveled throughout Europe in pursuit of his craft. He met Linnaeus in Holland when he was visiting the botanical garden in Leiden, and Linnaeus taught George exactly how he wanted plants to be dissected and drawn. By this time, Eret felt that his drawings were already aligned with Linnaeus, but the calibration didn't hurt. George's work made it possible for Linnaeus to show the differences between plants for his books. When Linnaeus released his catalog of rare plants called Hortus Cliffordianus in 1737, it featured 20 meticulous plates made by George. As a result of partnering with Linnaeus, George understood plant structure on a level that rivaled most botanists. George's style of drawing is referred to as the Linnaean style. George's father could have never predicted the impact of teaching his son both gardening and drawing, but the two skills had come together in George in an extraordinary way. One expert wrote that Eret was the greatest artist illustrator that Linnaeus had. Today, George's work is difficult to source. Given the rarity of an Eret drawing, they're expensive to acquire, and pieces generally start around $1,000 if you can find one. Just this past year, the New York Botanical Garden organized an exhibit called George Eret, the greatest botanical artist of the 1700s. They featured 48 of George's watercolors and engravings. Hope you got to see that. And today is the birthday of the French-German poet, naturalist, and botanist, Adalbert von Chamiso, who was born on this day in 1781. Born into a French noble family, Chamiso's family fled to Germany after the French Revolution. Shimiso is remembered for a number of different accomplishments. His creativity was captured in a novella published in 1814 called Peter Schlemiel's Wonderful History. The story is about a naturalist who travels around the world thanks to a pair of seven-league boots and who sells his shadow to the devil in exchange for a bottomless wallet. Seven-league boots were a common part of European folklore, and they allowed the wearer to walk seven times further than an average stride, making the wearer possess superhuman speed. Shamiso established himself as a romantic poet with his poem Freuen Liebe und Leben. The poem's English translation is A Woman's Love and Life and is actually a series of poems describing a woman's love for a man from their first meeting through their married life together and ultimately to the time after his death. Robert Schumann later set Shimizo's poem to music in his Opus 42, and it takes a soprano opera singer about 30 minutes to sing all of the poems in the opus from start to finish. After surviving the French Revolution and the war between France and Prussia, Chamiso eagerly joined a round-the-world voyage aboard a Russian ship called the Rurik. It would be the greatest adventure of his life. 
The trip was financed by a Russian count named Nikolai Romyantsev, who was eager to find a route around North America by water. It would later be discovered and called the Northwest Passage. Shimiso was the ship's naturalist, and Johann Friedrich Eschholz was the ship's doctor and botanist. When the Rurik ended up in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1816, Shimiso and Eschholz ended up exploring California for about a month. One of Shimiso's discoveries was the California poppy, which he named Eschholzia Californica after his friend, the botanist Johann Friedrich von Eschholz. In return, Eschholz named a bunch of plants after Shimiso was a little quid pro quo. The California rose is Rosa Californica Shimiso, and the California blackberry is Rubus vitifolius Shimiso, and they're both named after him. Almost 200 years later, in 1903, the botanist Sarah Plummer Lemon put forth a successful piece of legislation that made the golden poppy, the Eschultzia californica, the state flower of California. During his three-year journey on the Rurik, Shimizo collected over 12,000 species of plants, Today, his collection is preserved at the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. And it was Shimiso who said, In pain, a new time is born. This from the man who lived through the French Revolution and the Franco-Prussian War. And today in 1847, the city known as Yerba Buena is renamed San Francisco. San Francisco was originally known as Good Herb for the small mint-like plant that the early explorers found. Over the years, people have left their hearts in San Francisco. The author Rudyard Kipling said, San Francisco has only one drawback, tis hard to leave. Paul Cantor of Jefferson Airplane said, San Francisco is 49 square miles surrounded by reality. Ashley Brilliant, the author and cartoonist, said, There may not be a heaven, but there is San Francisco. And finally, the writer William Saroyan said, If you're not alive, San Francisco will bring you to life. Today is the birthday of one of America's greatest garden writers and one of the 20th century's most famous horticulturists, Louise Beebe Wilder, who was born on this day in 1878. Louise was born into a wealthy family in Baltimore. After marrying an architect named Walter Wilder, they bought a country place, a 200-acre estate in Pomona, New York. They called it Boulder Bray. Louise set about adding fountains, terraces, arbors, walled gardens, and pathways. She did most of the work herself. Her work called My Garden shared Louise's experiences learning how to garden at Boulder Bray, where one of her first flower beds was bordered with clothespins. What a cute idea. At Boulder Bray, Louise and Walter created a garden and a stone garden house that was made famous in Louise's book, Color in My Garden, which came out in 1918 and is generally regarded as her best work. In the book, Louise was the first garden writer to write about gray as a garden color she was also the first person to write about moonlight gardens and looking at plants under the light of the moon.
After World War I, Walter and Louise settled in suburban Bronxville, New York. Louise created a personal Eden there on a single acre of land, complete with stone pillars and a long grape arbor. It was here that Louise began rock gardening. And so after 1920, most of her garden writing focused on rock gardening. Louise inspired both men and women to rock garden. By 1925, Louise founded a local working gardeners club in Bronxville, and she also was working as a garden designer and a garden writer. Her experiences gave her material for her writing, and Louise included so many people from Bronxville in her writing that they often referred to her column in the newspaper as a Bronxville family affair. In all, Louise wrote 11 books about gardening. Her voice is pragmatic and pointed, which is why gardeners so appreciated her advice. For instance, Louise was not a fan of double flowers. In her book, The Fragrant Path, from 1932, she wrote, Some flowers are, I am sure, intended by a wise God to remain single. The hyacinth doubled, for instance, is a fat abomination. Louise also wrote for a number of publications, and her writing was published in many prominent periodicals, like the Journal of the Royal Horticultural Society in England and the New York Times. House and Garden alone published close to 150 articles written by Louise. In turn, many of Louise's columns were collected and published as her books. A year before she died, Louise was honored with the Gold Medal for Horticultural Achievement from the Garden Club of America. It was the pinnacle moment in her career, and it came as Louise and her children were still grieving the loss of her husband. In the spring of 1934, Walter committed suicide after a long battle with mental illness. Louise wrote prolifically about gardening and her knowledge of plants her entire life through. Her experiences resulted in increasing the awareness of different species and practices, and they helped shape the gardens of her time. Louise gave us many wonderful garden quotes. On snowdrops, she said, theirs is a fragile but hearty celebration in the very teeth of winter. Regarding rosemary, she wrote, it makes a charming pot plant, neat, svelte, with its dark felt-lined leaves held sleek against its sides. The smell is keen and heady, resinous, yet sweet, with a hint of nutmeg. On roses, she wrote, over and over again, I have experienced the quieting influence of rose scent upon a disturbed state of mind. And finally, on gardening, she famously wrote, in the garden, every person may be their own artist without apology or explanation. Each within their green enclosure is a creator, and no two shall reach the same conclusion. When I was researching Louise, I discovered that she's buried with her parents in Lot 41 in Lakeside Cemetery in Wakefield, Massachusetts. It was a shock to read that her grave is unmarked and to see that it is completely unadorned without any flowers, nor does it rest under the shade of a tree. 
In unearthed words, today is the birthday of the English poet and literary critic Anne Taylor, who was born on this day in 1782. Her sister Jane was a poet as well. Anne has a famous quote that says, the most important thing is to wear a smile. Anne and her sister wrote many poems about the garden. This is a little collection of poems that Anne wrote. This first one is called Come and Play in the Garden. It was written for children. Little sister, come away and let us in the garden play, for it is a pleasant day. On the grass plat, let us sit, or if you please, we'll play a bit and run about all over it. But the fruit we will not pick, for that would be a naughty trick and very likely make us sick. Nor will we pluck the pretty flowers that grow about the beds and bowers, because you know they are not ours. Here's a poem called The Gouty Flower by Ann Taylor. Why does my Anna toss her head and look so scornfully around as if she scarcely deigned to tread upon the daisy-dappled ground? So grows the tulip gay and bold, the broadest sunshine its delight, like rubies, or like burnished gold, it shows its petals glossy bright. But who the gaudy floweret crops, as if to court a sweet perfume, admired it blows, neglected it drops, and sinks unheeded to its doom. The virtues of the heart may move, affections of a genial kind, while beauty fails to stir our love and wins the eye, but not the mind. This last one's called The Field Daisy. I'm a pretty little thing, always coming with the spring. In the meadows green I'm found, peeping just above the ground. And my stalk is covered flat with a white and yellow hat. Little Mary, when you pass lightly over the tender grass, skip about, but do not tread on my bright but lowly head. For I always seem to say, surely winter's gone away. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Seed Underground by Janice Ray. The subtitle of this book is A Growing Revolution to Save Food. Ray writes, There is no despair in a seed. There's only life, waiting for the right conditions, sun and water, warmth and soil, to be set free. Every day, millions upon millions of seeds lift their two green wings. Janice's book takes us to the frontier of seed saving. She shares beautiful stories from gardeners around the country who are working to preserve our food by growing old varieties, heirlooms, and eating them. Gardeners will love this book because as a gardener, Ray is relatable and her stories feature ordinary gardeners who are trying to save open pollinated varieties of old time seeds, the true treasures in our gardens. Ray's book is not just about gardening, but it's also about preserving our food by saving seeds before they disappear. Ray helps us understand why seeds are under threat and why a lack of seed diversity is something that should concern all of us. Ray is a writer and a poet and a naturalist, and she's one of my favorite authors on this topic. So I hope you'll check it out. 
You can get a used copy of The Seed Underground, A Growing Revolution to Save Food by Janice Ray, and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $4. And here's a great gift for a gardener. It's one of my favorite things, and I can't collect enough of them. It's a clear glass cloche. And this one comes with a rustic wooden base. Stonebriar makes this particular cloche. The base measures 6.1 inches in diameter, and it's perfect for putting a candle in or doing what I do, which is putting small plants inside them. I love using cloches with little plants like my ferns or my begonias. This particular cloche is available in two separate sizes. This is the smaller one. The inner dome measures almost five inches in diameter and six inches in height. You can get the Stonebriar 9-inch clear glass dome cloche and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for $31.99. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of the American floral dictionary writer, Elizabeth Wirt, who was born on this day in 1784. Elizabeth was the second wife of William Wirt, who served as an attorney general of the United States. They had 10 children. In 1829, Elizabeth wrote her floral dictionary. She published it anonymously using the very mysterious name, By a Lady. Wirt featured lovely tidbits in her dictionary, quotes and prose by poets and writers, accompanying the information for each plant. Her dictionary also included extraneous information that would be of interest to gardeners in the early to mid-1800s. She included chapters on the structure of plants, the structure of flowers, and a sketch of the life of Carl Linnaeus. Elizabeth shared all she knew about the history of each flower that she featured in her dictionary. Gardeners adored her book. It was republished every two years. In the 1835 edition, Elizabeth finally felt confident enough to publish the book using her own name, Mrs. E. W. Wirt of Virginia. The final edition of her book was published in 1855. It was the first book of its kind in the United States to feature colored plates. You can see a copy of Wirt's Dictionary online for free. I've included a link to it in today's show notes. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org and be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.